Here. Welcome to the Political Economy and Law Lecture Series. I'm very pleased to present Dr. James A. Sweeney, who is Deputy Director of the Durham Global Security Institute. He is a senior lecturer in law, an expert on law in post-conflict and transitional societies. His particular focus is on human rights and the rights of refugees. He's giving us a talk today titled Restorative Justice and Transitional Justice at the ECHR. Thank you so much and welcome. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming out uh, to see me. And thanks again for the invitation and for, for hosting me here. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is this, this something I'm working on right now on restorative justice and transitional justice. But I'm going to try and give you a, uh, a feel for the kind of work that, that I'm doing and you can ask questions or ask questions about it, any, any of that as well. Um, if you've got any questions as I'm speaking, especially if my northern English accent causes you any difficulties, um, please do just stop me and I'll try and speak more like you, Brown. Okay, so you're probably wondering where Durham is. It's up here, northeast of England. Uh, well, there we are, and that's what Durham University looks like. Um, it's the third oldest UK, uh, university in England, in Cambridge. It's also the third best at Rotterdam in Cambridge as well, slightly frustrating. But anyway, it's one of the, the oldest and the most um, successful universities in the UK. Um, the university, this is one of the university buildings, um, the Durham Castle. We actually have students who live in this. Um, it's the oldest habitable university building in the world, apparently. It's, uh, um, it's an old Norman castle. Now, it's, the, the beauty of the building has not been lost uh, on various filmmakers, so you may find some of it slightly familiar. Um, give you an impression. Durham. Hogwarts. Durham. Hogwarts. Yes, they actually filmed uh, a good chunk of the first two Harry Potter films uh, at Durham University. They also used the universities as well, and you know, some of the buildings around the back had a heavy amount of computer graphics that we have to see as well. Um, but yeah, we, we did have uh, Harry come visit us a few years ago. Anyway, the first thing I said I was going to do was just give you a, a, a flavour of the sort of things that I search about. As we've heard in a very kind of introduction, um, I do work around the broad theme of post-conflict justice, as some people would call it, or transitional justice, as, as other people might call it. And I'm giving you a list there of kind of the, the sort of things that I've, I've published because it really breaks in, in two. My big area is the stuff at the top on European human rights law and transitional justice. Um, but I've got another kind of area in refugee law as well, which uh, I talked to a little bit about a, a few minutes ago. Um, so I'm just completing a book on the European Convention and transitional justice right now. Um, I've got a piece coming out in the new year on international criminal justice and transitional justice as well. That's in the, uh, the Baltic Year of International Law. Um, and I've been working on this field off and on now since, the, since I started my PhD in 1998. So, um, uh, so I guess I've been doing it for, for, for some time now. But if you've got questions about the, uh, the, the, you know, any of this, Afterwards, but I'm very happy to talk about it. I mean, in relation to the European uh, human rights stuff, I, I had the privilege of actually working with the Council of Europe itself, the, the, the parent body of the European Court. So I've been involved in freedom of assembly projects in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, and Kosovo, kind of working with the authorities there to try and help them comply with their obligations under Article 1 of the Convention, the obligation to put in place mechanisms to guarantee the rights that are in the European Convention. So I've got a, you know, a bit of practical experience as well there, kind of you know, deploying my research in these transitional issues. On the refugee side, um, I had a great experience in 2009 advising the Committee of the Regions of the European Union as they prepared their official opinion with a capital O on um, the package of reforms that were uh, put forward to reform the common European asylum system. Um, and that's a, a really interesting experience because I was able to basically put forward my academic point of view uh, and make sort of 
serious criticisms and proposals within the legislative framework and make the people of the European Commission kind of actually have to answer me as well, which is great. Um, unfortunately, you're probably well aware uh, the events recently um, in and around North Africa uh, and a certain dispute that's arisen between Italy and France uh, has uh, stalled the, the whole process of reform in the common European asylum system. So all that work that I did uh, is now sort of gathering dust somewhere in Brussels, I think, unfortunately. Okay, so um, I'll start with the, the main part of the paper now on uh, restorative justice and transitional justice. If you look through the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, you will see virtually no reference to the concept of restorative justice. Now, don't worry, I'm going to define all this in a, in a few minutes. In fact, there's only one reference, at least in English, to restorative justice in the entire jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. And that's in the case of put it there, Dockage versus Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, now, that's a case that's to do with uh, an ethnic Serb who fought in the uh, VGA, I think they called it. Basically, uh, one of the armed forces, you, were, you would only have served in that particular armed force had you been ethnic Serbian. The authorities in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina had refused people who had served in that army the uh, ability to regain. Uh, property that they had to leave during the conflict. Uh, and the guy won his case on the basis that that amounted to direct discrimination against his um, ethnic background. The facts of that case uh, are not, don't really need to detain us at the moment. Uh, the point is that in the judgment there is an oblique reference to the notion of restorative justice. But even that is only a quote from the, the so called Pinheiro principles. Uh, these are the UN principles on. Um, Housing restitution for uh, housing property restitution for refugees and displaced people. So the court, even in that case, doesn't really engage with what the concept of restorative justice might be. It just gives a, a, a quotation from these wider principles. Now there is actually, a, as I've said here, a, a rich jurisprudence on the restitution of the European Court of Human Rights. And has, has anyone here looked at that aspect of the case law before? Yeah, some, some, some people, okay. But there's a lot written on that, and actually one of my colleagues, a guy called uh, Tom Allen, he's a professor at um, uh, Durham, has, has written a lot on that as well. We disagree, <laughs> and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but yeah, he, he's written some really good stuff on that. Um, but I think there's a lot more to restorative justice than simply property restitution. So, limited explicit engagement with restorative justice, but I think that there are a number of implicit interactions with restorative justice in the uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. But, at first glance, would see that that engagement is going to be limited from the outset, that the European Convention presents certain barriers to the pursuit of restorative justice. For example, my colleague uh, Tom Allen here has said there's a strong, though and not universal, belief that there's little to be gained by investi investigating the stories of victims. Now, one of the things that we'll see when it comes to the definition of restorative justice in a minute is it's all about giving voices to victims. Uh, in a way that you don't normally see in a kind of antagonistic uh, form of criminal justice. So Tom Allen's comment there, he's actually writing about property restitution, gives the impression that the Court of Human Rights might struggle to deal with concepts like restorative justice. Uh, and Sharif Basui, who's one of the uh, real leaders on, on the victims' rights movement, uh, has likewise said, said that, at least in relation to property restitution, uh, human rights law and international humanitarian law really haven't grasped the, the potential that's there for dealing with um, restorative justice. They've ignored the victim's perspectives, he says. What I want to do in the paper is try and map what I think is uh, an interesting, I hope, interesting but complex interaction between human rights law Transitional justice and restorative justice. 
Can I just ask, ask another question? How, how many people here sort of see themselves as, as, as human rights lawyers? How, how many have you got a background in human rights? Okay. About, about half, I think. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to try and look at the, the relationship between them because I think these three things, transitional justice, restorative justice, and human rights law, might sometimes be in competition more than we perhaps might have seen in the past. So I'm going to start out by seeking a bit of definitional clarity, let's put it on there. Um, then I want to go over quite a lot of the jurisprudence, all of the cases here in the Court of Human Rights. Um, and then uh, to try to determine some uh, what I'm on here as uh, potential pitfalls uh, in the future. Now, the reason why I've used that phrase is um, I gave a, a version of this paper previously at a conference that had that title. And, and this paper that I'm giving to you today, I'm in the process of converting into a written piece, which I hope will be published next year, um, in, a, in a special edition of a journal devoted to, to that conference. Okay, so the first of the concepts I want to explain to you is the notion of restorative justice. Has, has anyone looked at the story of justice before? Perhaps especially if, you, if you've done more criminal law and not more familiar to you. Um, so the story of justice and criminal justice. The, the idea of restorative justice, as I say, might be more familiar to, to criminal lawyers. The first definition I put up on there is from a document produced in 1999 by Tony Marshall for the UK Home Office. Um, and I think his definition there is, is really helpful. It's a problem-solving approach to crime which involves the parts themselves and the community generally in an active relationship with statutory agencies. Now what you're going to look at there is that there's three components in the sense that it's the parties themselves and the community and the state. Often when you think about criminal law, it's just, you know, the state takes control of the whole thing. And the crime stops being a crime against the victim, it's a crime against the state. So the state pursues and punishes them. The state co-opts the relationship, the, the criminal relationship. So restorative justice goes back to making sure victims have a role in it, but it also brings in a role for uh, the community at large. Um, in a piece that was published this year in Legal Studies, uh, Jonathan Doak, who's just, just about to join the Law School as a professor, and David Mahoney, who uh, has an office right next to mine, um, so a bit of a Durham theme to this second quote, um, they sort of take this idea of a community involvement in restorative justice uh, and explain that, I think, very clearly. So, restorative justice is used crime primarily as a breakdown between private relationships. So when you steal a car, it's not just a crime against the state, it's almost obvious, isn't it? It's a crime against the, against the person whose car it was, who presumably worked hard to buy that car. And so if you accept it as a breakdown in private relationships, then ownership of the whole process allows you to engage with a broader range of, of what they call stakeholders, including the victim, the offender, and the community. So again, you see that it's not just you know, the public prosecutor and the criminal. It's got a, a role for um, the victim and the community as well. So examples of restorative justice might be um, kind of offender mediation processes where within the legal system, you know, you get the, the, the criminal and the victim to talk to, to each other. Uh, there's a lot of that, I think, that's gone on in, in, in New Zealand. Um, in the UK, for example, uh, now the victim or their representative is allowed to read a statement at the sentencing stage of the, of the criminal justice system so that the victim's perspective is taken into account when the judge decides how long the, the criminal should stay in jail. So again, that's another example of trying to import restorative thinking um, into the criminal justice process. I want to draw a slight distinction between restorative justice and so-called victim rights discourse as well, because there is another movement um, about the rights of victims, which isn't necessarily the same as, as um, restorative justice itself. Um, 
Jonathan Dokes, um, excellent book in 2008 on, on restorative justice, breaks down the idea of victims' rights into rights of protection. So this would be, for example, the uh, right of the victim uh, to anonymity, if needs be. Sometimes that might happen in, in, in rape cases. Um, or you know, special circumstances for child victims. You know, so protecting the victim in that sense. Right to participation for the victim to be engaged in the actual process. Because you might find quite a lot that the victim is almost forgotten uh, in adversarial criminal systems. A right to justice, a right to the, you know, the right outcome is presumably rather important. And also to reparation as well, to some form of recompense for their having become a victim. I mean, we often talk about uh, compensation in, in civil claims, um, but the recognition here is that victims of crime also might be due to some kind of recompense. Might be something tangible, or even an apology in some circumstances. Okay? So, uh, that's a little bit on victims' rights. That's crystallised um, more recently, uh, in 2006, in the UN Basic Principles on Victims' Rights. These, these are a, a, a basic document on the rights of victims of human rights abuses. And so there's UN guidance on that. It's not a treaty, so it's not legally binding or anything. Um, but there's now a really useful um, bit of UN guidance on that. Uh, Bussini, whose uh, article I mentioned um, a few minutes ago, he was heavily involved in drafting that, and he's written a, a very interesting commentary on it. Uh, I've mentioned a couple of other things there as well, including the fantastic book by Anton Deuce from Utrecht University. Uh, he's written a, a, a book on post from Cows and Restitution. I, I think I might have maxed some of his work in a few minutes. That all kind of ties into the victims' rights movement. So, restorative justice, it's about making the criminal system engaged with a wider range of stakeholders. It overlaps to some degree with the victims' rights discourse because restorative justice typically recognises a greater role for the victim than you might see in a regular um, criminal system that has no uh, engagement with restorative justice. Okay, moving on now to the other main concept in the paper. Transitional justice. Uh, is this a term you've come across before? Yes, good stuff. Um, it's strange because I think most people know it when they see it, but I've heard some very important people talk about phenomena that I would recognise as transitional justice without actually ever using the phrase. So, what do I mean when I say transitional justice? I actually mean two things. First of all, by transitional justice, I mean kind of a value-neutral label for the sorts of policies that are enacted in post-conflict, post-revolutionary uh, situations. And I think that is very similar to the guidance that was given by the then UN Secretary General, Mitra Kudros in 2004, when he described in his report to the UN Security Council uh, transitional justice being you know, the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with society's attempts to come to terms with the legacy of large-scale past abuses to ensure accountability, serve justice, and achieve reconciliation. So that might include things like lustration, I don't know if you've come across that phrase yet, the idea of making public officials declare whether they were complicit in the previous regime, then perhaps making them lose their job if they were. It might include, sorry, transitional justice might include property restitution, where property was unlawfully seized by the previous regime. It might include criminal prosecutions of people who carried out atrocities under the previous regime. So, the, you know, it, it, it's all those sorts of things. Most famously, uh, perhaps you might think of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, again, that's a, a, one of the most famous think, examples of, of um, transitional justice. So, it's an umbrella term for all those things that might happen or that, that might be a good idea in transitional contexts. More interestingly, I think, it's also the form of justice that is revealed by them. Because I think if you look at any of those policies that are commonly 
deployed in transitional contexts, they reveal something interesting about the use that law is being put to. I mean, if you think about these aims here, ensure accountability, yeah, I think we assume law normally does that. Serve justice, yeah, I think, mean, you know, law, I hope, would do that. But achieve reconciliation, no, not always. Think about it, you want to go to a courtroom and you want to win. You want the other side to lose. That's not about reconciliation, that's about winning. So law isn't always, I think, naturally geared up to reconciliation. So to the extent that these transitional justice mechanisms are using the law to achieve certain ends that law isn't always comfortable with, I think there's a different form of justice involved. So I'm quoting here from Ruth Teichel's book in uh, 2000. Her book was just called Transitional Justice. And she said it was the, the conception of justice, as you can see, associated with periods of political change, characterised by legal responses to confront the wrong ways of repressive policies and regimes. So she's kind of getting at the more um, theoretical side, I think. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe started to engage with transitional justice in 1996 when it gave out guidance on what the state from Central and Eastern Europe should do to dismantle the communist heritage that they had inherited. And they, they give a list here of the, the sort of practical policies that might fit in the umbrella term. Hello? I'll move forward by accident there. There we go. Um, at least we've had the walls working there. Yeah, so th those are the sorts of policies we talked about that are, that are in the basket that the UN would recognise. Uh, then we've decided it's a slightly more um, theoretical approach. Let's see if this works again. Marvellous. Okay. Um, now, one thing that you'll, you, you'll tend to see is that I think there's an assumption that human rights and transitional justice are, are bedfellows, that they work together. I'm not sure they do, not all the time anyway, because you might find that transitional justice policies, although they're a good idea, might themselves interfere with human rights. So transitional justice is all about seeking justice in relation to these you know, heinous crimes that have been committed by the previous regime. But that doesn't mean it's immune from creating new problems in its own right. If you think about some conceptual problems, first of all, so there's some practical ones as well, there's some conceptual problems. One is the conflict between transitional justice and the rule of law. Even, say, with a criminal prosecution, if you are a German board guard um, in the, the communist era, you have been paid and rewarded for committing what was later uh, deemed to be a crime against humanity. Well, what's the board of meant to do? Because when they were doing it, it was lawful. And one of the first impulses that I think we have as lawyers is that law should not act retrospectively. And so to a certain degree, that kind of prosecution is tainted with retroactivity. There are ways around it, and I'll explain that shortly as well. But you know, there's just a hint that there's something wrong there. The process of illustration has been criticised for being based on notions of collective guilt. Everybody involved with in the previous regime has got something to hide. Yeah? So again, that goes against the instincts of the rule of law. Property restitution, again, can cause huge problems because of the disruption to the present day owners of the property. You may have been living in a house as their home for decades, and the new democratic government comes in and wants to give the property back to the people from whom it was originally taken. Well, that might, seem, that might be a good idea, but it doesn't mean it won't violate the rights of the people who are in the property yet. So again, there are certain rule of law dilemmas where you can see that there are conflicts with um, human rights law. Also, I think in international human rights law now, there's a pretty well um, organised argument that there's a duty to prosecute um, where people have engaged in, in criminal behaviour. We know that it's positive obligation emanated from Article 2 of the European Convention 
to investigate suspicious deaths. And by the way, because um, kind of seminal 1991 piece on the duty to prosecute, I think spells it out brilliantly. Uh, she recently revisited it in the first edition uh, of the International Journal of Transitional Justice. Um, so the problem here is that human rights law demands a prosecution, but reconciliation might demand something else. So again, there's a slight tension between what human rights law would want and what transitional justice might want. So the uh, Oromica now um, does admit that you know a, a blunt, always prosecute approach is, is, is difficult. There are competing norms of policy outside of it. The reconciliation might be a good thing. So those are some sort of conceptual problems. There are some very practical legal problems though as well. And this is where I'm going to start getting into the case law. Um, there are some practical legal problems for international human rights systems. I'm going to really focus on the case uh, from the European Convention. Uh, Gunshow versus Portugal from 1984. Probably not one we've heard of. Has anyone heard of that one? Oh, um, good. Um, it made me sound smarter. Um, Gunshow versus Portugal. And this is a really good illustration of how the European Convention works and the limitations that it imposes on states going through periods of transition. The case was to do with uh, uh, the length of proceedings in a civil action. And what you can see from the first paragraph, the first quotation there, is that the Court of Human Rights recognised that had gone through a really difficult transition uh, in, the, in the early 1980s. Uh, Lead, you know, from the 70s to the 80s, this, this transition. And you can, I've underlined a bit there where the court is saying, you know, it had troubled circumstances which were without equivalent in most of the other European countries. So the court is definitely recognising that there's a difficult situation there in Portugal that had existed. But it's limited by the terms of the actual European Convention on Human Rights. Because, and this is my second point here. Article 1 of the European Convention, or should I say, by Article 1 of the European Convention, the states have signed up to guarantee the rights within it. The first thing it says, as you can see in, in Article 1, is that the states must secure to everyone within their jurisdiction the rights and freedoms in the Convention. Portugal signed up to that. Having done so, the court has no choice, it feels, but to hold them up to that standard. And so the third quote basically says, okay, we recognise you went through a difficult situation, but that doesn't absolve you, it cannot absolve you, from the commitment to uphold the rights uh, in the European Convention itself. Okay, so there are conceptual problems with the relationship between human rights and transitional justice, centred on the rule of law. But there are also practical problems as well. Human rights systems find it difficult to create the right sort of exception to allow the ingenuity that transitional justice might sometimes demand. Moving a, a little bit further through, I just want to say a little bit about these um, further problems with international human rights. If you ignore transition, states have been through, be it the Southern European transitions of Spain and Portugal and Greece, or the recent massive wave of transitions in Central and Eastern Europe, if you ignore that, um, it could give rise to a certain, and I've been using a fantastic quote here, dynamics of condescension towards those states, to just not realistic. On the other hand, if you give too much weight to those states and say, you know, you're allowed some flexibility, because you've obviously had a difficult time, then you get the double standards. You get that problem in Article 1 of the European Convention. And, some would argue, it would threaten the universality of human rights, because you were admitting that people who live in a transitional state deserve fewer rights than people who live in a democracy, which is obviously a difficult situation to, to justify. So, Moving on to the bulk of the analysis then now. This is the first of my kind of major claims in the paper. And that is that um, 
within the European Court of Human Rights interaction with restorative and transitional justice, there are three distinct types of interaction. And so on the next few slides, I'm going to break these down uh, into, as I say, specific attempts to do with the past year, huge things like truth and reconciliation commissions, reform of the criminal justice system internally as a process of becoming more democratic, and then the wider application of restorative justice principles outside these specific attempts to reckon with the past. So, specific attempts to deal with the previous regime. If you look at peace agreements that have been concluded, you will quite often see that there are elements of restorative justice built into you. It might be that the terms of the peace agreement require an exchange of property, or they require compensation to be paid to certain victims. So you can see that there, you, there may well be elements of restorative justice in peace agreements. A potential problem from the human rights perspective, though, is that just because it's in a peace agreement, that doesn't protect it from scrutiny by human rights institutions. And I think the, 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 the best and one of the most controversial examples of that arose actually quite recently in the Sedic case. Um, this was a case where the Court of Human Rights criticised the Dayton Peace Agreement, which had you know, concluded the um, hostilities in the former Yugoslavia, on the basis that the Dayton Agreement allowed for discrimination uh, against certain ethnic groups, including the Roma. And so the Court of Human Rights, in its first case on the new freestanding discrimination provision, found a violation of the European Convention based on the dated agreement itself. Now, if you look at the judgment, the dissenting opinions are extremely strong because the, the dissenting judges are saying it's not for the Court of Human Rights to kind of tear up the dated agreement which had been created in rivers of blood or words to that effect. I mean, it's really powerful language. So the, 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 the dissenting judges were saying, you know, you cannot tear up peace agreements like this because they're so, so important. So there's a certain, certain problem there that you may find sorry, justice uh, within peace agreements, but that doesn't protect them from human rights challenge. I'm not saying that discriminating against the Roma is somehow justified as part of restorative justice. Uh, just an example. So there's peace agreements, there's also um, domestic prosecutions. One of the things which tends to happen after a change of regime, uh, we can see in Egypt at the moment with the Barrett trial, is that domestic uh, prosecutions take place. Now, prosecution isn't the most obvious form of restorative justice. In fact, in the first part of this paper, I explained that restorative justice is most visible when people take alternative approaches to dealing with crime, not necessarily a trial. Nevertheless, there is a certain overlap in the sense that, you know, if you do prosecute the criminal, it does deliver justice, in a sense, and that can help um, the, the, the individual victim to respond to their own situation. Uh, I've said that slightly bit um, disputedly. I mentioned before that Article 2 of the European Convention would seem to require that uh, uh, investigations and prosecutions take place. And that based on that, uh, an ingenious reading of Article 7, which is the prohibition on, on uh, retroactive prosecution and punishment, um, the European system has managed to kind of get round the idea that there is a, a rule of law dilemma presented by. Uh, these sorts of prosecutions. And it's done in two main ways. It's said it's not retroactive to prosecute these people from the previous regime because what they did was um, criminal according to international law at the time. Now that is a historical question. So that in the cases on this, the um, Court of Human Rights had to investigate the state of international law at the relevant time. But nevertheless, the argument still remains that if it was criminal in international law, then you can't defend yourself by saying it was lawful according to domestic law. 
Um, so you see that argument in cases like uh, Colton Pazilts versus uh, Estonia. Um, there's also a, a, a second approach that's more visible in the German border guard cases. Um, so there's the uh, Strelitz case, which dealt with the high ranking people responsible for the uh, Berlin Wall and the uh, putting kind of automatic machine guns on there and mines and things. Um, and the KHW case, which is to do with a, an actual um, relatively young border guard. The Court of Human Rights allowed the prosecution of those people and got around the retroactivity point, not just by international law, but by saying that if you, if you read the East German law that existed at the time, that prohibited precisely the sort of action that's taking place. It's just that nobody was paying any attention to it. So, um, academics of Poznan and Remuel uh, have described the approach of prosecuting those people according to the domestic law which existed but wasn't being used. And they described that as taking nominal law seriously. And again, the argument is that sort of prosecution isn't retroactive because you're using domestic law which certainly existed. It's just that for whatever reason the previous regime wasn't taking it seriously in the new, uh, the new state of world. So, you can see a certain sort of interaction there on execution. I was trying to be clever again. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay, now the issue of amnesty. And I said that's perhaps one of the biggest, almost obvious forms of restorative justice. It goes against our impulse to achieve punishment. Um, again, the biggest example would be the South African uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where in return for participating in the commission, uh, people were granted uh, an amnesty. It can help to sort of forge a uh, system of sort of collective or national healing. That, on the other hand, could also come into conflict with international human rights or and in fact, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has explicitly held that blanket amnesties violate the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. The ECHR, on the other hand, in a case which very little attention seems to be paid to, the, the Dujardin uh, Admissibility Decision in 1991, appears to uphold the possibility of amnesties, although it appears to have changed its mind recently. I'll just give you a couple of quotes from there. All that bit. So this is the, the Inter-American Court. Has anyone come across this case before? Yeah? Okay. So here the, the Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, is, is saying that uh, amnesties basically violate a whole range of uh, human rights. So what you've got here is a tension between perhaps a noble mode of reconciliation and international human rights law. As it happens, the Inter-American Court was more concerned with kind of, you know, these corrupt kind of self amnesty laws where dictators say, well, we'll step down and come here and prosecute um, But the point is, there is certainly some kind of conflict between the idea of human rights law promoting prosecution and transitional justice connected to restorative justice um, going on to the more reconciliatory. Here's the Dijon case. Um, this dealt with New Caledonia, a uh, French sort of colony, I think. Anyway, um, there was an uprising in a prison, a bunch of people got killed, uh, including various police officers. Um, the perpetrators were then amnesty. And the family of the police officers brought a case to the European Court of Human Rights saying that the amnesty was unlawful and lost, remarkably. Um, so look at what the court here says, it's an admissibility decision, remember. So actually it's the European Commission that was that, not the court. Um, before Protocol 11. Um, the amnesty law is entirely exceptional in character, and it was in the context of a process designed to resolve conflict between various communities of the islands, say in Caledonia. So already it sounds strangely receptive to the situation. It says it's not for the European Commission to assess the advisability of the measures taken by France. Um, 
more the question on whether it interferes with human rights. And it says that in the present case, the Commission considers that the balance was maintained and there's been no breach of the European Convention. Now, that's remarkable. And it's also been completely understudied, in my opinion, as well. That's a statement that the European Court of Human Rights is saying an amnesty law is OK. That's completely contrary to what the English American Court was in the process of developing. It hasn't been tested since. The old dark cases it isn't actually a challenge of an amnesty law. I think. In passing, the court in that case, which is far more reasonable, does stand for the balance of opinion in international law is that amnesties um, are not acceptable. But in the only case that is decided upon its merits, the Court of Human Rights, the European Commission on Human Rights, appears to have accepted that the amnesty was OK. Uh, international criminal law um, is itself, if you think about it, a form of transitional justice. It's what to the title described the steady state of transitional justice. Um, and there are elements of restorative justice in there as well. I mean, if you look at Article 68 of the Rome Statute, there's all sorts of interesting rights of victims. Um, so there's elements of restorative justice in there. Okay, we want to the second of my interactions. So that's, that's all the big conscious kind of national approaches to dealing with uh, transitional justice, which engage with restorative justice. Now we'll go to, uh, you might think of actually a slightly smaller scale, and that is reform of the criminal justice system as part of the process of democratisation. So, in criminal law generally, via the European Convention, there's no sort of right to justice. You won't find a demand for it. It's a policy choice. It's one that can be useful, but there's certainly no right to it. And the court versus the UK uh, dealt with whether dealt with the sufficiency of a private inquiry into um, a death. The court kind of said that didn't do enough for the victim's rights. So that gives you a sense that although there isn't a right for historical justice, there's limited recognition of victim's rights. Um, in T and V versus the UK, it was through the uh, child killers of the toddler James Bulger. Um, the mother of the toddler who had been killed was very angry that she didn't have a role in the domestic prosecution of the children who killed her son. The European Court of Human Rights allowed her to speak in Strasbourg, and afterwards, the mother was, I don't know whether pleased is the right word, but was um, content that the Strasbourg Court had allowed her to have a voice in, the, in a way that the national system hadn't. So again, although the European Court can't require restorative justice and can't, can't sort of demand it to take place, there are examples of it allowing restorative techniques to, to, to play a role. Moving on to the political side, the Council of Europe itself does give advice um, on how to do restorative justice. So it must be something the Council of Europe you know, understands and has an opinion of. Um, there's a number of recommendations there. Noting that there are still risks for human rights, you can see that here. This is. Maybe you can. Thank you. Um, so this is just a, a caution we know from the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Sorry, it's the Union Ministers of the Council of Europe. Um, talk about mediation saying yes, it can be useful, but there are risks to human rights. So although the Council of Europe clearly understands restorative justice, clearly recommends it in some circumstances, it notes that restorative justice and human rights law are not always pointing in the same direction. <coughs> My colleagues, um, Jonathan Dover and David Mackey, nevertheless point out that restorative justice might have a very particular and useful role in transitional societies. They've done a lot of work on so-called youth conferencing in Northern Ireland. This is dealing with um, relatively low-level crime committed by juveniles. They've said that getting uh, the victim, perpetrator, and community leaders together to solve the problem after the judicial process has been completed. Um, is really useful in a transitional context because people are often very sceptical of official authority. They don't really trust the state. And there are huge problems in Northern Ireland where the people do or do not trust the police, for example. Remember, the, uh, the police was controversially renamed 
to, to, to try and draw a clear line between the days of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, the RUC, and what it is now, police service of Northern Ireland, that symbolic change of name, you can tell it's because people have real scepticism about official them. Um, so restorative justice, that sort of conferencing, they argue, presents certain advantages in these sort of fractured transitional uh, contexts. And, and there have been attempts to roll it out in, in the former USSR, which is where I do quite a lot of my work. I was in Kazakhstan three weeks ago. Um, so one shouldn't laugh at this, but there's a, 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 a report uh, that's come out with a rather unfortunate quote in it uh, on uh, the deployment of historical justice in relation to rape, which I just saw an article by, by Akron. We've had great success with mediation. We've even had several women marry these men, uh, which is, would seem to be missing the point uh, about historical justice and rape. Anyway. So, moving on to the third of my um, interactions. <laughs> And this is the appearance of restorative principles in the wider jurisprudence of the Court of Human Rights. And hopefully this is where my research makes its biggest contribution, I can say that, because I've spent an unhealthy amount of time reading the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. There is, uh, well we've talked briefly about the, the uh, rights of victims discourse, and then to talk briefly about truth, memorialisation of history, and then reparation again. Which is where we're back to where we started. So, truth, memorialisation, and historical justice. As the periods of conflict, getting to the bottom of what happened is crucial. History, truth, becomes contested and hugely important. The creating of national myths of peace or national stories of suffering, you know, this is a, a contested and important part of what happens uh, in post-conflict situations. Some legal systems have recognised their explicit right to truth. Again, the inter-American system is ahead of the European system here. Uh, in the Baroness Altas case, uh, the inter-American court kind of joined up several of the substantive articles of the inter-American convention and, and created from them a right to truth. The European system hasn't gone as far as that. The European system is still really um, restricted by its initial approach in, in the Leander case, which said that there is no right of access from the European Convention anyway to public documents. Even though Article 10 of the European Convention, if you read very carefully, um, gives you a right not only to impart but also to receive information within the concept of freedom of expression. Um, there have been some movements recently, in a case that I can't pronounce, um, and in relation to disappearances in Chechnya as well. The Human Rights Commission for Bosnia and Herzegovina, though, which was a domestic body, was charged with interpreting the European Convention in relation to the uh, um, conflict in former Yugoslavia, and using the same source text as the European Court, obviously the European Convention, and um, it did actually create the right to truth. Of course, it can't bind the, the European Court, it's not authoritative in that sense. But my point of, of, of mentioning the, the Palich case is that it's not impossible to create a right to truth from the text of the European Convention, it's just that the European Court hasn't done it. It would be very helpful, I think, if it could. But you see, that's not the only way that truth and memorialisation can be achieved through human rights law. There's been some real progress on gaining access to communist era documents in Central and Eastern Europe. Now imagine if you've got a suspicion that the authorities used to have a file on you and you want access to it. Now, that's a terrifying position to be in. Um, the Court of Human Rights has recognised that it can be a violation of home, family and private life where access to those documents is withheld and there isn't a very good reason for them remaining secret. The court has created, I think, a very useful point of principle. You cannot assume that communist era documents are valid and still secret. There has to be um, uh, you know, a, a need in the present day. And we see that in Montero and Haralambi, uh, which are very similar. Again, this is where somebody wants information about himself, which may have been held by a previous regime. 
Kennedy versus Hungary is an interesting one because that's Article 10. This is an author who was writing a book about the Secret Service in Hungary. Uh, he wasn't given the information that he needed to write his book and successfully argued that uh, violated his right to freedom of expression. So I think that's actually put quite a remarkable case showing that the court is supporting attempts of people to get to the bottom of what happened in the communist regimes. Petrenko versus Moldova actually has more in common with these first two. It's somebody trying to get information about themselves. The reason why I've mentioned it there, though, is that there's a very interesting separate opinion by judges uh, Garlicki, Sikuta, and Kualungi. I've said that right, but probably not. Um, they go so far as to say um, that there might be positive obligations now to release these documents. Now, that isn't in the objective part of the judgment. But I think it's, it's really interesting that we've, we've moved on from the, the relatively weak position in Leander through to the case that I've talked about, Rotter and Harley and Kennedy, and now to judges openly talking about there being positive obligation to release those documents. So I think that's a really good development. And it contributes to historical accounting, to memorialisation, which are hugely important to victims and therefore intersect with restorative justice. Yeah. The access to uh, these documents is only to the uh, victims, or is this only public? Um, Rotter and Halambi and Petrenko were seeking information about themselves, yes, that's right. And Kennedy was different because he wanted more general information um, so for, for, for his book. But yeah, the, the bulk of these cases were individuals wanted to find out um, what was held about them. Uh, and then using the European Convention, they were allowed to gain access to it. I mentioned the notion of illustration before. Uh, this is the idea of kind of vetting people in, in positions of authority to make sure they aren't tainted by their, their role in the previous regime. Well, you might wonder what that has to do with this context, this uh, idea of, of restorative justice and its intersection with memorialisation. But of course, if you make all the politicians stand up and say, Yes, actually, I was complicit. That contributes to the national story. It contributes to getting to the, you know, the bottom of what went on in the previous regime. So I think actually there is a connection between illustration and um, historic justice. Um, there's a lot of law on that, but I, I yeah, I, I won't go into all that. If, they, if anyone's got a healthy interest in illustration, I can say a bit more about it um, in a while. Another point I want briefly to make, I'm not going to say it in depth because I've, I've written a separate article about this, is the attempts by certain people to use the Court of Human Rights as a way of settling historical scores. So, for example, the Court has recognised that certain things are just historical fact, specifically the Holocaust. Anybody who denies it, um, will not be protected via Article 10 of the European Convention of Freedom of Expression. It, it will be knocked out at the admissibility stage by Article 17 on the abuse of right, because it's kind of common knowledge that the Holocaust in fact happened. Moving on to events surrounding the uh, Russian annexation or not of the Baltic states, it's got a bit more difficult. So there's been a number of cases involving the Baltic states you know, that deal with you know, quite a range of historical and transitional justice issues. But what you see is, regardless of the, the, the legal merits of the case as a matter of human rights law, you'll see that the Baltic states on one side and modern-day Russia on the other seek to try and get the Court of Human Rights to say whether or not the annexation of the Baltic States in 1940 was lawful or not. Needless to say, Russia says it was, they say it was not. Uh, so there's been an attempt to kind of enlist the European Court finally to solve the historical dispute as to whether or not the annexation of the Baltic States was lawful or not. Because, you know, court judgments take on a ritual function. They're sort of magic. They're you know, if you can get something in a legal judgment, it must be true. 
I don't believe that. But you get the idea. People want to use the legal system to settle these historical scores. And the Court of Human Rights is, 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 is you know, by no means immune to that. So you've got people trying to use the court to settle big historical, story, um, historical debates. My piece that's coming out in the Baltic Year Book of International Law um, next year deals with that in, in a bit more depth. Um, and I gave that paper initially, uh, that, that panel, uh, chaired by the Latvian judge, and the Russian judge was sitting in the audience, which was a slightly interesting experience, you might imagine. Um, reparations. This is where human rights lawyers tend to get most excited by restorative justice. It's the only bit many human rights lawyers really engage with. Um, I'm not going to say too much about them, except that the Court of Human Rights is not particularly good at demanding them. Again, in terms of restitution and confiscation of property, there's two big principles. One, no general obligation to return the property. Two, not even an obligation to create a legal regime in which the restitution can be requested. And my colleague uh, Tom Allen has described the supervision of restitution uh, as being obstructive. The Court of Human Rights supervision of restitution as being obstructive. But I contest that it's really as grim as all that. I think restitution, as an element of restorative justice, as an element of transitional justice, has actually been supported by the European Court, contrary to what my colleague Tom Allen would say. Because the Court of Human Rights has clearly held that restitution property is in the public interest. You can see that in Zvolsky and Vol Zvolska quote there. Okay? So the restitution scheme was there to redress infringements of property rights committed by the previous regime. The Court holds that trying to deal with that is legitimate. Um, it even supports in private individuals giving it back to uh, other private individuals, not just the state doing it. And I think when you really read the full text of the, the, the judgment, um, I think it's quite clear that the court, although it has found fault with the way that certain institution schemes have been operated, actually understands the point of it. So you can see here, and it, uh, the language is really interesting. The court has no doubt the Bulgarian restitution law um, pursued an important aim in public interest. And look what it says next. It's obvious that compensating victims of those arbitrary explosions was an important step in the restoration of democracy. So I think, although the Court of Human Rights has certainly found that some restitution schemes violate the European Convention, that is a long way from saying that the court is hostile to restitution as an element of both transitional and restorative justice. I'll skip that quote then. Um, so I think the court's given a clear message that restitution is, is, is a good thing. Uh, the Valley Coffee case, this is one where the court upheld uh, well, the, the legitimacy of a scheme where individuals were forced to give it back to the people who originally had the property taken from them. Um, it, it has certain superficial similarities with these schemes where the, where the uh, perpetrator has to give property back to the person they stole it from, which is a quite common form of story of justice. But, and this is a crucial caveat, I am being a little bit disingenuous there because for a story of justice to work, it has to be consensual, whereas this is you know, very much compelling. So, conclusion. One of my propositions here has been that the link between transitional justice and restorative justice, and there are clear links, imports some of the tensions between international human rights law and transitional justice. Now, I'm very interested in potential, potential for human rights and transitional justice. I don't know whether that's something that you've looked at before, but uh, you know, hopefully that's a, an interesting conclusion. It doesn't mean that the goals of restorative justice, though, are completely opposite to the aims of the European Convention. In fact, we've seen support for restorative justice 
right the way through the court's jurisprudence, that would be, in relation to illustration, restitution, prosecution. Um, there are certain limits, I'm admitting, I'm, I'm admitting certain ones here. The, the European Convention limits recourse to amnesty. Although the Kishapin case is a bit interesting there. It's an amnesty demand reparation, but it certainly has, has said that as a political concept it's a good idea. I think it could do more on uh, the right to truth, um, and I think it could perhaps uh, understand that it is being asked to play a very political role with these, these questions of historical truth. Um, some of the criticisms that the court has come, you know, uh, has been, some of the criticisms about the court, I think, are confused what is ideal with what the role of the European Court of Human Rights is. So, although it might be a good idea to embark on a restitution, that doesn't mean to say it should be done as a matter of human rights law, because there's a difference between them, pointing here from Jack Donnelly, whose book was doing that's in touch with human rights law, I saw it in the library of the book. Um, uh, he's, he, he's distinguished between what is a right and what is right. It might be right for me to give money to somebody who is begging if I have the money in my pocket. It doesn't mean to say that person has a right to my money. That's the difference between what's right and what is the right. Um, my approach uh, to that question, I think, respects subsidiarity. Article 1 is the most important article in the European Convention. The states should do the job themselves. That they should seek to achieve their ends in a human rights compliant maximalist way rather than do the bare minimum and waiting for the European Court to contradict them. Respect and subsidiarity, of course, will allow for the recognition that uh, there's diversity between transitional states. The Baltic states have their experience. The states from the former Yugoslavia have their experience. Russia has its own. Germany has its own. And not least of all through reunification. So I think we need to recognise that there are differences between those states. And I think that uh, my approach would, I think, square the circle between allowing for local variation on the one hand and preserving the sanity of human rights on the other. But that is the topic of the book that I'm writing, so I'm not going to say too much about that right now because I haven't finished writing the book. Um, okay, and I think that's about it for now, so thanks very much for listening.